Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the HCDVCC Board Spotlight. My name is Rebecca Council. I am the Digital Media Director here at the Council. Today, our spotlight is with Donna. Donna, would you please introduce yourself and tell everybody what you do? Yes. Hi, Rebecca. I'm Donna Amsberg, and um, for my work for my living. Um, I'm a faculty member at the Graduate College of Social Work and I am a clinical associate professor. I am also a researcher and I'm also the director of the trauma education program here at the GCSW which really focuses on advanced level master's students who are working on their social work degree and who are wanting to become mental health practitioners with a trauma-informed background. And so this is a program that really focuses on teaching individuals therapeutic work from that trauma-informed perspective. And then um, on the side, my private practice, I'm a licensed clinical social worker and I'm also a board certified supervisor, meaning that I supervise individuals who are LMSWs and they are working on their clinical license. And, um, but my private practice is in equine assisted psychotherapy. So I work with clients um, through a model in which um, we collaborate, so to speak, or we work with um, horses. And it's an amazing part of my life. And it's probably one of my favorite parts of my job. Wow, I did not know that. That's very interesting. That's very cool. Yeah. Um, so with the Graduate School of Social Work, that's out of U of H Central? Yes. Okay. I was like, um, it sounded familiar, but I wanted to make sure that I was correct. Yeah. So you're a busy, busy lady. Yes. And I, I don't really know anybody nowadays who isn't. That's very true. Very true. And so what is your position on our board? I am a board member and I'm not sure if we're an executive board now that I think about that and I'm saying it out loud I've always just referred to myself as a board member and you've been with the board for how long I've actually been with the board pretty much since its beginning it started in 1996 and I think I officially joined in 1997 but it was I think a, a matter of months after it had begun um, when I actually joined as a member Wow, so you're one of the original board members. You're one of the OGs. Actually, not as a board member. I was actually joined as a member. I was working at the district attorney's office in their family criminal law division at the time. And uh, the HCDVCC had just started. Prior to that, I had been um, the president of CATO, which was the Coalition Against Domestic Abuse. And it was a smaller group and it was a group that had been around for some time and we had, you know, all of the board, the trappings of all the board kind of stuff. And I was the acting president at that time and we met monthly and what this board focused on was working with individuals in the domestic violence world, but that those were individuals that were really providing the direct services and not necessarily in a position where they could make policy or practice decisions, those kinds of things. And so this was a board in which we brought in guest speakers and we had different topics that we addressed each month. And this was a very collaborative kind of community-based organization, so to speak. And when the DVCC started, that board kind of went away. And so I joined the HCDVCC at that point. And we were so lucky for that. Thank you. Um, so, you know, people join boards for different reasons. And so what does this work mean for you? Domestic violence work, I think for me, it's hard to pin it down to one or two things. In some respects, it means everything. In, it has been my career. It has been the bulk of my career. I've been in the field for over 30 years. Um, it has allowed me to do work that I am so proud of. I am so grateful for the amount of people that I have been able to interact with over the years is countless. I think probably my most favorite aspect when I look back on my career in domestic violence, I think the thing that I am most 
proud of is the Pet Safe program. And that was one that myself and a representative from the Houston SPCA started back in 1997. And it is still a viable program. It is still um, at the SPCA and still working. In fact, one of their social workers, um, she and I are regrouping to do kind of Pet Safe 2.0 to make it a little bit more, uh, to, make, to kind of keep up with the changes that the world has gone through as well. But this work is, I can't imagine, and over the years, I think anybody that's been in the domestic violence field has had people say, gosh, how can you do that work? And my response is always, how can you not? When you know that, that all these things are taking place, how can you not be and try to be the best agent of change that you can be? That's true. And so you mentioned the pet safe. Mm -hmm. So I know what the pet safe program is, but I'm sure there's people who don't. Can you give a brief explanation of what the pet safe program is? Sure. PetSafe is a program in which it is housed under the SPCA, and this is a program that is set up so that if an individual and a family are leaving a abusive or violent home to seek out safety, animal companions are not generally welcomed, even, even this long um, since PetSafe started. Animal or women's shelters and programs like that are generally not set up to take in animal companions and the SPCA, that is their job. And so this is a, a combination between the two that if a family is leaving to go to shelter and to safe place, their animal companions are not left behind with the abusive partner. They are in fact able to be sheltered with the SPCA at no cost to them. And with the whole goal of being able to reunite the family because shelter for humans is not meant to be long-term. Shelter for animals is not meant to be long-term. And so this is a way of getting everybody out of the family um, and in one fell swoop. And what happens, is, and we know from decades of research that animals are oftentimes the very first victims in a home. And, um, it is a way of bringing the family back into the home by threatening to hurt or kill the animal companion. So this takes away that, that piece. Such a great program. I, you know, when I first heard about it, I just, I couldn't believe that a, that, well, I shouldn't say that because, you know, domestic violence, you wouldn't believe it, that it happens anyway, but it does. But I never knew that animals could be used as manipulation as well when it comes to, you know, the abuser trying to get back at the survivor yeah. and vice versa. And so, you know, sometimes the survivor won't leave because they don't want the companion to be hurt or, you know, be used as leveraging. And so for programs like this to help keep everybody safe, it's just an amazing tool. And I think one of the big questions that someone outside of the domestic violence field always has is, is why, does, why don't they leave? Why, why don't they just leave? Well, if your animal companion, like my animal companions are, they are my family. Mm -hmm. um, I can't imagine leaving my home in whatever state I'm in and not be able to take my pets with me. Yeah. That, that I can't even fathom that. And when you realize that most domestic violence programs are not set up to, to shelter animals, then that takes away that whole opportunity for somebody to actually leave safely and to get into a safe place because they're not gonna leave behind their, their family members. Yeah. It's like I said, it's almost as though we're asking, and for some people it very much is asking, well, just, you know, you leave the house, but leave your kids with the, with the abusive partner. That's, no one would, think that that was a reasonable idea and for many people and for men you know for the entire time of we've been providing services to domestic violence victims it's essentially what we've been asking them to do yeah behind part yeah of I have a friend who um who had a abuser live with her and she felt bad because the abuser is from out of state had nowhere else to go so she just sucked sucked it up and uh, when she got ready for the abuser to leave, she found, you know, the only way out. And that was for the abuser to go back home to deal with family issues. And she couldn't go because she was in school. Mm -hmm. And so he was like, 
in order to make sure that I'm coming back, I'm taking the dog. And she's like, take the dog. I will be here. I will be in the same spot when you get back, you know, take the dog, take good care of the dog. I don't care. And, you know, she, every day he would call her at the exact same time to make sure that she was home from school and he would want to be put on speakerphone so that he could like, listen, I don't know what that was about, but so that he could listen to see if there was like anybody else in the house or to see if there was a different sound in the background to make sure that she was at home. And uh, the day before he was scheduled to come back, she left. Like she waited, she got everything situated. And the day before he was supposed to come back where she was supposed to send him the plane ticket to come back, he left. She left the house and she was like, I don't care if he comes back, I'm not gonna be anywhere. And so um, then she had um, the police go with her to that house to get the dog. And she brought the dog to the new place. And so, you know, him pulling that on her she was like, I'm not doing it. Mm -mm. And so for somebody to have a safe space for their companion to go while they're getting themselves situated is an amazing thing. So there are people in our lives who influence us in personal or business or both or whatever. Barbie talks about people who influence her all the time. And usually it's people on the board. And so my question for you is, who is an influence in your life and why? It's people on the board <laughs> in a lot of respects. I mean, it's, it's, this sounds kind of like a Hallmark card, but I mean, it's all the people, all the women before me that came and that helped me learn this work and supported me when I couldn't understand what was going on and supported me when I was trying to change programming and things of that nature. Um, Toby Myers is the first person I think of. I, when I was in the master's program here at the graduate college, one of my, my, my first internship placement was at um, ABDA. And so I was a group facilitator for the battering intervention and prevention program. So I got to literally sit next to Toby or across from Toby the entire time for, you know, like six months or so, um, learning how to work in a group setting with individuals that were court ordered because of battering intervention um, orders. And learning from somebody who had created that work was in and of itself just amazing and then to be able to take away all the lessons that I learned from that and unless you and that's a part of the work that a lot of individuals don't um, have an opportunity or take the opportunity to actually become involved in and it's interesting work it is eye-opening it was very different than what I thought it would be. And what I come away, what I came away with it then and what I still believe now is that by and large, these individuals are adult survivors of child abuse and oftentimes sexual abuse. And this is baked in. This is not genetic so much. And this is not a mental health issue by and large. It is, this is learned behavior. And when you paid attention to what they had to say, and when you spoke to them with respect, then you, you were able to oftentimes to see kind of a sea change in that individual, that they started to not only listen to what they were saying themselves and having to address that, but they were listening and were starting to become more open to listening to the other individuals in the group and learning from the group as well. And it was a really, really powerful experience. But we have, we have amazing people on the board and um, Barbie's one of them. I mean, that's, she's a, she is a force to be reckoned with. I think everybody on the board is, in fact. Yeah, our board is very, um is very outspoken and our board is very much the um if you need me in a dark alley i will meet you in the dark alley type of people they don't back down from any challenge at all and so yeah. our board i think our board makes our organization better and for people like you being on the board i think that it's because of people like you and so okay. i am so honored and so grateful to be part of this organization with the board as fierce as y'all 
Well, thank you. You 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 have brought so much to our board as well, and so I don't want to minimize your contribution either. I try. I just I follow the footsteps of where they lead. <laughs> we all do. Sometimes we are stumbling behind, and sometimes we're forging ahead. So it just kind of depends on what's going on. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you spending this time with me and letting people know so much more about who y'all are as individual people. Um, and um, if you um, have any comments for Donna. I will be happy to get them to her. Just leave your comments in the comment section below. Um, and we appreciate you watching this video and wanting to learn more about our board. If you have questions about HCDVCC as an organization, feel free to check out our website at hcdvcc.org. Donna, thank you so much. And I am so honored to have gotten to know you a little bit better. Well, thank you, Rebecca. It was good talking with you. And we will see y'all on the next episode of HCDVCC Board Spotlight.